seated. Let's turn in our Bibles as we continue to study 1 Peter verse by verse to chapter 5. And we will uh, look at the first five verses this morning. And I should uh, say that this would be the sort of passage that would naturally be avoided. Uh, these passages tend to be uniquely uh, preached and taught at pastor's conferences and things of that sort. And the question that a lot of people can ask uh, when they're reading this passage is, well, why is that important for me to know this seems to be about elders? Uh, and it's important for you to know because you are the church who elects your elders. Uh, and you've probably been in the church where the election didn't go so well. Uh, and so it would pay for you to know what the Bible says an elder is supposed to look like uh, and why uh, elders exist in the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, and so uh, we will begin reading at verse 1 of chapter 5. Remember, Peter is writing to people who are suffering. They're in trouble. Uh, Claudius has confiscated all their property. They lived in Rome in 49 AD, and now they've been exiled to what is in now modern-day Turkey. Uh, and because that's true, they have lost everything for the sake of the gospel. And now uh, they are the diaspora living all over the place. And Peter writes to them to be encouraged. And you would say to yourself, if they've been suffering so much, why in the world does he have to slip this conversation into suffering? And uh, that will be the root of our understanding of this text. So, I exhort the elders, plural, among you in particular. I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. So the Apostle Peter identifies himself not with his apostolic prerogatives, but he reminds them that he is a fellow elder. As a fellow elder and also a witness of the sufferings of Christ, uh, people comment on that because they say, well, Peter didn't actually watch Jesus be crucified. And that is uh, true, but it's a misunderstanding about the sufferings of Christ because Christians read the Bible and think that uh, Jesus lived this really cushy life uh, and didn't suffer until the last three or four days. And that is a complete misunderstanding of the Incarnation. The humiliation of Christ from, was from His very birth. It was a humiliation for the God of the universe, the Creator of all that moves and breathes, to become a zygote. It was a humiliation from day one, and it was suffering from day one that he endured. And so Peter was a witness of the sufferings of Christ as an apostle, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd, and here are the instructions to the elders, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. In other words, they're not shepherded on YouTube. They're not shepherded remotely. You don't shepherd anybody long distance. You shepherd the flock of God that is among you. And how do you do that? By exercising oversight. Well, how do you do that? Well, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but instead eagerly. And not domineering over those in your charge, but instead being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you know who that is, right? Okay, that's Jesus. It's like Sunday school, the right answer is always Jesus. <laughs> All right, that's the chief shepherd. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Uh, this is not decided by birth certificates. He's not saying uh, those uh, who are younger in age uh, be respectful to those who are older. He's talking about uh, leaders in the church. And so the context is those who are younger in the faith pay attention to those who are more uh, mature uh, in the faith. And all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. And he's not just talking to elders there, he's, talking, he's saying that's the entire economy of the church. 
The church is built completely on humility uh, with one another. And why would you do that? In one of the most underappreciated verses in the Bible, but one I'm going to pound home relentlessly this morning, because God opposes the proud. He's against that. That's something that God will not tolerate. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, this morning as we come to your word, I pray that uh, through the grace of Jesus Christ, you will right now, through your spirit, grant us humility. Humility that we might hear the authority of your word and we might discard our own private authority and accept the authority of our Creator in Jesus Christ. And I pray these things in His name. Amen. Uh, so when MacArthur shows up after the big war, he announces why he's there. You know, this is like the movie. The guy gets off the plane, he's got the big briefcase, he's got the Ray-Ban sunglasses on. The movie begins. Why? Because the fixer is in town. He's going to take care of whatever the problem is. It's probably George Clooney. <laughs> but he's going to fix it. The guy shows up in town. He's the new sheriff. He's got the badge. He's Wyatt Earp. Why is he there? He's going to fix it. There's a problem that needs to be solved. Something needs to change. And so Jesus shows up. You call that Christmas. The problem is, Jesus said he showed up to do something that you don't give him credit for. The new sheriff in town. I can't picture Jesus wearing Ray-Bans, but if it helps you <laughs> with the illustration, go for it. The fixer comes to town. He said, I, come, I came to do something. Now, listen, if God in the flesh announces, pre-announces, before the crucifixion, before the resurrection, before anything, if he makes an announcement, he says, this is what I came to do. Doesn't it behoove you to say, you know, I better pay attention to that. I, I need to be on board with what he came to do. I don't want to be caught, you know, with a different motive or a different game plan or a different agenda. I want to be on the agenda of Christ. I want to be uh, moving in the trajectory uh, that Christ is moving. He said, I came to do something. Okay, that's interesting. What was it? And prior uh, to him ever going to Calvary, prior uh, to uh, his time in the grave, prior to his physical resurrection uh, from the dead, uh, prior uh, to the 40 days where he taught uh, all of his disciples and prior to the ascension, before any of that, he said, I came to build my church. Let that sink in. That's what he came to do. And his church he defines as his body in a metaphor. The body of which he is the head and the king of. And because he is the king and the head of his church, uh, it's really important to understand uh, what uh, he is trying to get done. Now we have a lot of ideas about that, don't we? Uh, if I ask people what church is, um, it would almost take all day for he, me to hear all the answers. Uh, it begins by thinking the church was an afterthought. Uh, Jesus rises from the dead. He hangs out with the disciples for 40 days. He teaches them. He ascends to the Father. And now the apostles are saying, well, I wonder what we're going to do now. We've got to come up with a plan. We're going to need some organizational skills. These 12 guys did not have any organizational skills. They had none. What are we going to do? And so, you know, they came up with a little plan. Maybe they hired somebody from McKenzie. You know, you need a consultant. And uh, they got together in a big meeting and they created a business plan. And that business plan they called the church. And that has nothing to do with reality, but people operate as if that's what's happened as if the church was some sort of afterthought, something to accommodate 
an otherwise spectacular event that now put them in a position to not quite know what to do next. Oh, I know, we'll, we'll make a church. Uh, if that were true, we wouldn't have church today. If that were true, you wouldn't be sitting here because those 12 guys did not have the wherewithal to put that together. But now, 2,000 years later, it's not just that we're in every country of the world. It's not just as a church on every quarter. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we created Western civilization. You wouldn't even have the world that it is today without Jesus Christ. And if you don't know that, you haven't read one page of history. And so we need to get on board with what Jesus is doing, not what we think we should be doing. And Jesus, when he came uh, to build his church, it means that you don't get Jesus without his church. You know how it goes. Well, I'm okay with Jesus. I'm pretty spiritual, you know. How are you now? It's that whole church thing I don't like. If you don't like Jesus' church, you don't actually like him at all. Because this is who he died for. This is what he came to build. I'm not sure uh, what uh, flow of independent thought you think that you can go to the king of glory and say, you know, you came to build a church, but I'm not really interested in that. And Jesus will say, if you're not interested in my church, you're not interested in me. Because that's who I'm the king and head of. My people. And it's worse than that because uh, if you can't uh, get uh, his church, you can't get his church without his structure. And you might say to yourself, and we have a lot of churches like that, well, I love Jesus and let's have church. Well, good. What's that church look like? And then you go in and look at it and it doesn't look like anything Jesus said to do with it. It has no resemblance to what Jesus said a church is supposed to look like. And I ask people, what is church supposed to look like? And I get every crazy answer you can think of. They, they want to sound spiritual. Well, it's a hospital for the sick. All right. Uh, you know, it's, it's a club. And it's, it, we do a lot of social good. Okay. None of those are Bible answers. None of them, not a single one. Uh, so what we have to do is decide how does the king and head of his church who came to build his church structure his church because if you oppose the structure of his church, you can expect it to disintegrate. It won't go anywhere. It just won't. Uh, and so he begins by talking about that. First of all, he says there, there is a structure, something that we don't always recognize. But the Lord has actually structured his church in the way that he wants it structured. And so it makes sense if we get on board with that structure, whatever that is. But it's not merely a structure in a vacuum. It's not contentless structure. It's not as if we can, you know, the, re the latest thing from some Harvard MBA and say, sort of build the organization around that. You know you're in trouble when they start calling it an organization. <laughs> Uh, but the structure of God's church isn't a structure at all unless it's a humble structure. Into the very warp and woof of the church of Jesus Christ, every single bit of it, every molecule, every cell, the blood that flows in the church's veins must be the blood of humility. And if it isn't, it won't be Christ's church at all. It'll be something else. Uh, and then uh, he says, uh, if it is the church of Jesus Christ, and it does have the structure Jesus gave it, it will be humble. But if it is truly humble, genuinely humble, authentically humble, it will be observable humility. You won't be able to say, we're humble, but we just don't look like it. <laughs> No, it will be observable humility, and then he defines uh, what that is. So first of all, he says, there is a structure, and the structure is in three words. I write, as the Apostle Peter, to the elders among you. That's the structure. Now think about this for a minute. There is not a single diphthong 
in Scripture that's unnecessary. And that means that elders in the plural matters. In other words, I don't write to you as a singular pope or bishop. The structure of my church is a plural structure and a particular structure. I write to the elders, plural, among you in particular. It's plural and it's particular. Uh, you know, when we got the first church, it wasn't that this church didn't have any elders. It wasn't in the Constitution because they didn't know what an elder was. And there were eight people here. And you have to ask yourself, well, why is that? It's because it wasn't structured according to Scripture. You don't get to eliminate one of the offices of the church. Elders are to lead the Church of Christ. And so now we have elders, plural, not just me, elders, plural. Why? Because you don't want just me. <laughs> you don't. Uh, you want other elders to sit and say, Steve, don't do that. And if you don't have that, you won't have a church. And so we have elders among you, which means that eldership is particularized to a particular group of people. And so I give you the example that sometimes shocks people. And that is this. I am not the pastor to every Tom, Dick, and Harry in Waterville. I'm not a pastor at large. The elders are not elders at large. Uh, we are elders to those among you. Uh, and in the back of your hymnal, there's a covenant. And when uh, you become a member of this church, we stand and say the covenant together. And what is that covenant? That covenant is a public promise to stay in a relationship with one another. And I can't be the pastor to anybody where we don't have a voluntary relationship with one another and have covenanted with one another to grow together in the Lord. Without that promise to each other, I can't impose eldership upon someone who is unwilling, nor am I pleased to say that anybody can just walk in and make me be their pastor. Do you see how that works? It makes perfect sense. It's the elders among you. So it's plural, and it's particular. Uh, but not only does he say that, he says the structure has a C-suite with a job description. Do you know what the C-suite is? C stands for chief. Yeah. So uh, if uh, you are reading the Wall Street Journal, uh, you'll often hear, so-and-so sits in the C-suite. What that means is he's either the chief operating officer or the chief executive officer. If you get called by an executive recruiter and they say, hey, Bob, uh, we have a job in the C-suite for you, you want to take that call. <laughs> it's a good call, and there's probably some money behind that call. The C-suite. Well, guess what? The Church of Jesus Christ has a C-suite. Who sits in the C-suite? The elders? No. The chief shepherd. That's who sits in the C-suite. Elders are middle management. We have a CEO. We have a chief supervisor. Uh, we have a chief shepherd, and his name is Jesus Christ. And we all work for him. He is the king and the head of his church. And woe uh, be to the church that doesn't understand that. Uh, but that uh, chief shepherd has a uh, job description. Uh, and the job description says to elders, you are to shepherd the flock of God. Now, what does uh, shepherding solve? Shepherding solves a problem. Uh, do you remember, uh, during the Lord's Supper, I will quote a verse to you virtually every time. All we like sheep have done what? 
gone astray. By the way, that is what sheep do. Uh, sheep wander. They wander off. And the cheap shepherd says, uh, Elders, you are to shepherd my flock, those are my people, so that they don't wander off. You are to feed them and protect them so that they stay within my care. Not within your care, within my care. Uh, do you remember who this guy is that's writing? And that should mean something to you. You know, if you get a letter uh, from, you know, someone really famous, uh, if you get a letter from Bernie Madoff and he says, you know, I'm really good with money. <laughs> Maybe not so much. Uh, but if you get a letter from Warren Buffett, you might want to read that one. Well, who's this letter from? It's from Peter, who did what? Who denied Jesus Christ. Who denied him. Uh, but he was restored, uh, wasn't he? And if you read through the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost, he was a firebrand. And how did he get that way? Do you remember John chapter 21? Jesus pulls Peter aside. And he said, do you love me? Peter said, oh, you know I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. And then Jesus asks Peter again, yeah, but do you love me? Peter's now starting to get irritated because he's like that. <laughs> you know I love you. Good. Tend my lambs. Third time. Peter, do you love me? Now, if you're Jesus, asking three times makes sense because how many times did Peter deny him? Ah, that's right. Well, you're such good little Bible scholars. <laughs> Unbelievable. Three times. Exactly right. So he asked Peter again, do you love me? And what is the answer? Feed my sheep. Three times, the way that you show your love to Jesus is to feed his people. And what do you feed his people with? The word of God. Not with your own nonsense. Not with stuff you make up. Not with political nonsense. Not with a bunch of socially conscious stuff. But with the Word of God, because nothing else will nourish the sheep of God. So there is a structure. It's the elders among you. And they have a job description. They are to shepherd uh, God's uh, people and to feed uh, the sheep. But that structure isn't just a structure in a vacuum. You can talk about structure, and the minute you can do that, you'll start filling that empty container with a lot of nonsense. Because what he says is that structure must be a humble structure or it's not godly structure at all. All godly structure is humble uh, uh, structure. Because you see how he ends the passage? God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And uh, we don't like to think about that too much, but you understand that human pride being a know-it-all that doesn't need Jesus puts you at opposition with the creator of the universe. And so I ask you, is that a fight you really want to get in? I mean, think about it. Is that a fight you really want to get in? Or might you want to say, you know what, let me buy you a drink. We can work this out. Uh, if you want to challenge the creator of the universe, you can mouth off for a while, but that's going to bite you in the lower abdominal area at some point. Because he opposes the proud. And we don't think much about this, but you know, I could stand here for the next hour and quote your Bible verses. You know, Proverbs 8, uh, 13 is a good one though. Pride and arrogance and perverted speech do I hate. The Lord is not indifferent to pride. The Lord isn't saying to prideful people, oh, look at him, he'll grow soon enough. The Lord says, I hate it. Don't do it.
because it puts you in opposition uh, to me. Pride makes you God's opponent. But when we say God gives grace to the humble, our tendency is then to become fixated on humility. But that's not the path to humility. Don't fixate on humility, fixate on the humble Jesus. Uh, and as you know, love, and follow Jesus, and as his spirit indwells you, the spirit of the living God will conform you to the image of the humble Jesus. Uh, but if you go for humility all by itself, you don't get either one. You don't get humility or Jesus. But if you go after Jesus, if you seek first the kingdom of God, all these things will be added unto you. And so uh, humility doesn't come by fixating on humility. Uh, humility comes by fixating and fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. Uh, the one who grows you, the one who transforms uh, your mind. And so we have to think about that. And often what we think of as humility is uh, if I'm really humble, I'll sort of have a low opinion of myself. And I want you to think about that for a minute. Because that's not humility. Remember uh, what Paul said to the Corinthians, uh, what do you have that you were not given? Uh, and so uh, what we often do and identify it as humility is we actually have a low opinion uh, of how God has gifted us. God gives you great and wonderful gifts. And because God has gifted you in a particular way, uh, you're not then obligated to have a low opinion of go what God is doing in your life. That's not humility. That's a lack of gratitude. That's a false humility. You, uh, you know what false humility is, right? We have another word for false humility. It's called lying. You're not more spiritual by lying about it. Uh, C.S. Lewis was always colorful. Do you know who C.S. Lewis is? Mm. Uh, and he was talking about humility, and he put it this way. You know, we have this sense of false humility, you know, that we're supposed to somehow have a low opinion of the way that God has created us and the gifts that he's given us and the talents and things of that sort. And C.S. Lewis put it this way. He said, yeah, pretty women pretending to be ugly and clever men pretending to be fools. <laughs> That's not humility. That's false humility, and you don't need to think like that. You can revel and praise the Lord uh, who has gifted you with uh, your talents. Uh, you have to understand, though, that the surest way uh, to ruin humility is begin to begin to notice it. The surest way to ruin humility is to begin to notice it. You know how it is, right? Someone comes along and, and you say something that you think is pretty humble. Yeah, well, you know, just thank the Lord that I was able to get that done. And, and then the minute they leave the conversation, you say to yourself, you know, I was pretty humble right there, wasn't I? Uh, that's called pride. <laughs> you know, you don't want to be proud of how humble you are. <laughs> it's tricky. So uh, uh, humility in Scripture isn't thinking more or less of yourself, as the case may be. Humility is not thinking of yourself at all. It's just not on the radar screen. In fact, as Paul put it to the Philippian church, you want to be humble like Jesus Christ? Esteem the other person as better than yourself. That's humility. That would fix a lot of marriages, wouldn't it? Running around, very concerned that people aren't giving you the proper treatment. Because it, it's a sure sign that they don't respect you. No one respected Jesus, if that's the definition. Just nobody. No, a uh, godly structure is a humble structure. But if it's humble structure, he says, finally, it's observable. Uh, you know, we can't congratulate ourselves for humility. You've, you've seen this guy, and you've probably seen him at church. And, you know, he's kind of rough around the edges, and he's kind of tough on people, and he's gruff. And he's scaring people away from the church. It's almost a cliche story. 
and you go in, the church has 20 people left, and there's one guy running the place. And he's running it right into the ground, presided over the biggest collapse of a church in his life, and yet he says, I just do it all for the church. And then everybody around him says, well, you know, he, he kind of comes off tough, but really down deep, he's humble. No, he's not. Because of his real humility, it actually is observable. It shows up. And what does Peter say under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that a humble elder looks like? Well, first of all, he says uh, humility uh, doesn't uh, resent the work. He said, how are you supposed to exercise your oversight in verse 2? Not under compulsion, but willingly. You want to do the work of the Lord. That's humility. And if it's not humility, you'll want to do your own work. And you'll resent it because you didn't get your own way. It's always the work of the Lord that wins. And then he said, if it's humility, uh, humility doesn't line its own pockets as God would have you, not for shameful gain. Not for shameful gain. You ought to put that uh, on every YouTube channel. Uh, Jesus Christ went to the cross, and he didn't go there in a private jet. It's ridiculous. And Christians send these fools money. Why? They're not your pastor. Because they're not among you. They're Christian entertainers. And I say Christian small c. Because it's fake Christianity. Stop it. The Lord has called you in his sovereign mercy to Waterville, Maine. If he wanted you somewhere else, guess where you would be? Somewhere else. And then he calls people uh, to his church. That's you. And he says, now that you're here, be humble with one another. Build a church to the glory of my name, right here and right now. And don't be influenced by a bunch of remote entertainers who call themselves fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. Fill in their pocketbooks, fly in private jets and living in mansions. Stop it. That's not the church of Jesus Christ. And finally, he says, if it's humble, it doesn't get pushy. Do you see what he says? Not domineering over those in your charge. Humility doesn't push people around. Elders are called to be persuasive, but not pushy. One of my favorite ex uh, examples of Paul talking about his own apostolic ministry. Uh, do you remember what he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5? He said, because of the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. That's what we're in the business of. So you, what am I in the business of? Of being persuasive. But I'm not in the business of being pushy. And nobody else can be either. I think you uh, know an elder like that. I think you all have a personal relationship uh, with that kind of an elder. I think you're sitting here this morning because you know an elder who conforms to this pattern. And his name is Jesus Christ. He is the great elder of his sheep. And Jesus Christ willingly not for resentment but willingly laid down his life in John 10 he said no one takes it from me and because he willingly laid down his life you do have an elder you do have an elder brother who has come closer to you and you have an elder in Jesus Christ who not only willingly laid down his life but uh, he didn't do it for shameless gain. Do you remember what he said in Matthew 8? Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He came with nothing, and he left with nothing except your soul. 
He purchased you on Calvary. And you are a Christian this morning because the shed blood of Jesus Christ was sufficient and His grace was sufficient to redeem you for Himself and to call you into His church of which He is the King and the Head. He did this willingly, a great elder. And He I did this not for a shameful gain. A great elder did it for nothing. But finally, you have an elder in Jesus Christ uh, who does not uh, domineer. Do you remember what he said in Mark uh, chapter 10? I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. Folks, this morning, you have been called to the structure of Jesus Christ. We don't get to make it up as we go. We must do it His way. And because that's true, if you will faithfully live within the structure that the Lord has given us, you will flourish as a son and daughter of Jesus Christ. And you'll do that not because of the sinners who are elders here. Believe me, you've never elected an elder in the Church of Jesus Christ who wasn't the deepest of sinners. But you will do it because you have a chief shepherd, a chief elder, who serves you willingly. He laid down his life willingly. You have a chief elder who does not serve you for his own gain, but serves you for your gain, that you might have eternal life. And you have a chief elder uh, who does not domineer over you. He doesn't lord it over you. But he persuasively, lovingly, calls you to himself. Come home. Come home. Let's pray together. Lord, this morning, we thank you that you have called us into your body. Uh, this is not a faceless organization. This is the Church of Jesus Christ, which is your body. And I pray this morning, Lord, as the King and Head of this Church, you will continue to conform us to your, Im your image. May we hear your call for the sake of Jesus, I pray. Amen.